Hi, this is Professor Bennett from digitalaudiotheory.com. This programming example comes from Chapter 8, which covers FIR filters. In these two examples, we're going to look at cross-correlation, which is a process quite similar to convolution. Whereas convolution is an algorithm for combining two signals, for example, an audio track with an IR to imbue the character of that IR into the audio track, Cross-correlation is an algorithm for comparing two signals. In fact, the only difference between convolution and cross-correlation algorithms is that one of the signals is not time-reversed for cross-correlation. So as the sample index n is incremented, the output of the correlator is a moving similarity score that compares two signals at two different lag times, or time shift differences. So this generates two important outcomes. One, how much does one signal resemble another at any given time shift? And two, precisely when is the peak similarity? So the value of the cross-correlation is maximal when the two signals are time-aligned, resulting in the most amount of overlap. Importantly, the polarity of the two signals does not change the magnitude of the output, only the sign of it. So a value close to positive 1 or negative 1 both indicate high similarity scores, with the negative sign indicating only a difference in polarity. Now, two important uses of cross-correlation in digital audio are discussed in the following two programming examples. First, we will look at cross-correlation to time-align two recordings. It's not uncommon in digital audio uh, signal processing to have multiple recordings of the same source that are not time-aligned. This could be due to microphone spacing or effects processing that introduce delays into one of the signal paths, but not the other. Cross-correlation provides a way to estimate the time delay difference of two signals. So consider two sequences, X and W. They're both recordings of a drum kit, and both of these are downloadable from digitalaudiotheory.com. But the sequence uh, W was recorded from 20 feet away to capture room effects. But this resulted in a delay of about 17 milliseconds. If the microphone distance was not known to us beforehand, and these signals were mixed together without delay compensation, some frequencies within the two signals would be out of phase, resulting in a combing or thinning of the sound. So we will estimate time delay using cross-correlation. Let's load these in. We can estimate our time delay, of course, if we know the distance. We said it was about 20 feet away. So if we take 1100, 20, 1100 feet per second, divide by 20, did that backwards, multiply by 1000 to put this in milliseconds. Here we see about 18. This all depends on the, the value of the speed of sound that you use. You'll see uh, values as low as um, 1050 feet per second, or as high as maybe 1130 feet per second. So we have a range here. Now we're going to make use of this built-in function. Let me load these in, Let's see if I did. Let's listen to both of these real quick. So the built-in function, xcore, uh, will quickly compute our cross-correlation. And it returns two outputs. One, the similarity value. And two, the corresponding lags for each of these similarities. So let's run this. And what we want to look for is we're going to apply the absolute value to similarity. Like I said, sometimes will be positive, sometimes will be negative. But this just a, is a phase difference. We want to look for the maximum. And when that occurs, that's going to be the index, the sample index, of maximum similarity. OK. So if we take our lag and we check what's the value of the lag at that index, C753.
Let's plot, let's see what this looks like. We're going to plot the similarity score against the lag. Here we go. So you can see roughly pretty close to zero, time zero, um, is definitely where our maximum similarity is going to occur. But we're going to be slightly off again because there's a little delay baked in. Let's add a title here. We can, in fact, see. Uh, that this delay is occurring at 17.1 milliseconds, which is pretty close to our estimate um, that only differs uh, by what exact speed of sounds are you estimating. All right, so cross-correlation can also be used to perform what's known as matched filtering. So this is going to happen in our next programming example, 8.4.2 that we can take a look at now. Let's clear out a few things here. So cross-correlation can be used to perform match filtering, which is the process of finding a specific template within a recording. So this could be used for, for example, transient detection. In this example, we're going to use a template of a snare and cross-correlate that with the template, uh, excuse me, cross-correlate that template with the drum loop. So a very large similarity score indicates the presence of that snare, uh, which will be plotted, overlaid upon the drum loop waveform. So let's load these in and listen to them real quick. I think the audio file is going to be the same, and it's going to be the same. Um, these are downloadable from digitalaudiotheory.com. Let's listen to X. Let's listen to our template. So this is our snare template. So that's what we're going to be looking for inside the audio file. So as we co uh, cross-correlate these, very large similarity scores will indicate the presence of that snare. So this can be plotted and overlaid on top of the drum waveform. Now, we're going to look for similarity scores greater than 50. And the threshold of 50 was chosen through a bit of trial and error. Uh, but we can see that the points of large similarity occur when the snare is present in the file. Here we go. So I've placed a stem anywhere that the similarity score was greater than 50. Let's listen one more time to this uh, file. So you can see that it's identified the location of the snare. And in the next programming example, we will examine a specific type of artifact that can occur with FIR filtering. Until then, thanks for watching. <laughs>